Uh, my name is Paul Chu. This is Talking Rock Farm here in North Carolina, Western North Carolina. And as, as you can see around me, this is a, a very wooded in area. So I consider this a forest garden. Uh, and there's some advantages of that uh, and disadvantages. Uh, it's cooler. It doesn't have full sun. So I, I <clears throat> kind of specialize in salad type production. So a lot of my garden is geared toward growing lettuce and salad mix. Um, originally this was a sheep pasture that I had carved out of the woods here. And, uh, and then we got rid of the sheep and then I thought, well, this would make a great garden. So uh, I did some plowing to establish rows. This is all raised bed, uh, beds here. Uh, I guess <clears throat> this would be considered uh, intensive gardening or farming. Um, I'm growing mostly salad mix, lettuces, and then uh, various things that I add into that. So I have a specialty mix that I add into lettuce. So I have things like dandelion and kale and some herbs such as dill, uh, some chives and garlic, and probably about 10 or 12 different uh, items that I add to, to the salad mix. Uh, so now I have a clientele that comes to the market, to the farmer's market, every week, and they want my salad mix. And I have a big wooden bowl that I got from my son that's probably 100 years old, and I mix up the salad mix in it and then when people come I bag it into bags and they take it home. So I found my niche so to speak here uh, again partly because uh, it's a little this microclimate in this forest garden is cooler not full sun and so I can grow lettuce pretty much all summer long. Uh, Whereas if, if you were out in a full sun garden, you're, you're probably going to quit growing lettuce, you know, around this time of year. Um, I have to start new transplants uh, about every two or three weeks now to keep up production because they're going to mature very quickly, you know, in, in hot temperatures. We're up to 90 degrees now almost. So I have to keep putting in uh, more, more plants. Uh, I start planting in uh, late winter, very early spring. I use cold frames. I have low hoops uh, over here that I put plastic over. And I can <coughs> direct seed into a bed or into a cold frame or into uh, flats that are going to go out later. Okay, I, I utilize cold frames for both seed starting and for a little winter garden. Um, most people think that you need a greenhouse uh, for starting plants, but I've found that a, a cold frame probably has advantages over a greenhouse and they're cheaper to uh, keep up and all that. So um, I have two cold frames here. One I use for kind of a winter garden, which gives e easy access to, to food. The rest of my garden might be under a row cover which would take a lot of work to take off. Also, I, I direct seed in, in the second cold frame, late winter. Uh, I'll direct seed thousands of seeds in a cold frame, and then I can take those transplants and move them out into the garden. Uh, this is, these are kind of unique in the sense that they're, they're heat storing. So I've, I have a solar panel and then a fan, and then underneath the soil is a series of three corrugated pipes with gravel and insulation. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the heat during the daytime and dumping it down in the soil uh, during the day, and that's, that's keeping the whole cold frame warm at night. <clears throat> Your soil temperature is probably the most important thing, the air temperature temperature could be cooler, but if your soil is warm, the plants are going to grow. 
Also, you notice uh, they're earth berms, so the back of the cold frame is block, concrete block filled with uh, concrete, and it has earth behind it, which maintains a, a warmer temperature. Uh, the tops are twin wall polycarbonate. They have a vent, that op automatic vent that opens and vents in both sides. So uh, it pretty much takes care of itself. You don't have to worry about it overheating. Okay, so I mentioned about raised beds. And uh, for me on a small scale garden or even a, a mini farm like this, raised beds are the answers or the answer to uh, year-round growing. Um, because you've got good drainage, they warm up quicker in the spring. Uh, so I can get out here in any weather. If it just rained, I can still get out in my garden and, and work. Whereas in a, in a field, you know, uh, you're going to have to wait for that field to dry up before you can even get in and till or plow or whatever you're going to do. Um, <clears throat> I did start out uh, tilling these rows and then very gradually I moved to now I don't do anything. So uh, I'm a much lazier gardener now and I realized that uh, the l <clears throat> sometimes the less you do the more the better it is. So uh, and another issue I had was I, I incorporated a tremendous amount of leaves into this garden, about 10 tons of leaves on a quarter acre every year. And that created a situation where earthworms, you know, multiplied. So I had millions of earthworms. Well, then along comes the moles. Uh, mole is a uh, carnivore. So it, they come in and they're eating the earthworms well, at the same time, they're plowing my garden. They're burrowing under the beds uh, and loosening up the soil. Uh, then the voles come in, which are uh, omnivore or whatever, you know, they eat plants. And they follow the tunnels of the moles and, and they continue that process of, of kind of, uh, you know, loosening up the soil. So when people come to me and go, well, I've got voles, what should I do? I just say, hire them. And plant some things they like, like they like carrots. So every year I'll plant carrots in my garden for the, for the voles. And that saves me having to do any kind of digging or tilling or whatever. Um, and <clears throat> one of the reasons for not tilling is your, your Anytime you disturb the soil, you're disturbing the structure of the soil. So all your, your worms and your, your macroorganisms are creating uh, passageways for water to percolate down in. And that's so that by doing less in your garden, by not disturbing the soil, you're allowing water to go down into the ground instead of running off. So you don't have erosion, you don't, you're not losing your topsoil. And your water is going into the ground where you want it to. Uh, disadvantages of uh, raised beds are they're going to dry out quicker. So you're going to have to water more. You know, if it's if it's hot weather, hot dry weather, you're going to water more. But there aren't a whole lot of disadvantages. But there are many advantages to uh, raised beds. I'm tall too, so if I'm harvesting, it helps to to have the bed, you know, up eight or ten inches high. I don't have to bend over so far. I find it uh, much easier 
to garden year round than to stop and start. Uh, and, and there are several reasons for that. One is just that you're not letting your garden go and the weeds take over. Uh, secondly, it's you, you really need to be in tune with uh, the weather all year. So a year ago in January, uh, I was working in my garden and uh, it was a very warm day and I felt the soil and the soil was warm and I thought, it's spring. And even though it was January, I realized it was time to start planting. So I planted spinach and beets and chard and the spinach came up in a week and I, I did little mounds of dirt and, and planted the spinach. So every year is going to be different and spring is going to come at different times. This year it was cold and wet and rainy uh, and I used a little different technique this year by making mounds and planting seeds and using some plastic uh, to warm up the soil. Uh, so I find it very beneficial to garden year round. The other uh, thing you would notice about my garden is you don't see any rows and you don't see things grown in a group. So I kind of have a haphazard garden. And if you look at nature too, if you look out in the woods, well, everything is mixed up. And uh, there's some advantages of that and disadvantages. If, if you have an insect problem, if you don't have a whole grouping of uh, plants together, you're less likely for all the plants to, to have a problem. Uh, disadvantage if I'm harvesting, I have to wander around my garden continually. If I'm picking collards, then I have to walk through the whole garden. Well, you know, that's really not a disadvantage because when you're bending over a lot harvesting, you really need to straighten up and walk around some. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is um, I'm an oper opportunistic, opportunistic farmer, meaning um, I'm doing intensive uh, gardening or farming. And when I look at an area in a bed, I'm looking to see if there's any room to put a plant in and what kind of plant do I want to put there if I'm putting in onions or garlic or lettuce. So I'm always trying to maximize the use of the space that I have. I'm not doing cover crops, you know, where the garden's not being used part of the year. So it's pretty much in production all year, all year long. Uh, might be nice every seven years if I quit farming for a year, but so far I haven't done that. Uh, another aspect of small gardens and farms is that you're not growing one crop or, or what's called a mono culture. So you have a variety of crops and uh, in my case I'm actually spreading everything out, mixing things in so that, you know, if, if some bugs get one plant here, well they may not be getting over to another one somewhere else. Um, I wanted to talk about small scale farming as well and the advantages of that. Uh, and First of all, you're, you're, you're growing for a, a local community and you're providing food that's fresh to the community. So one thing people say to me is, well, your salad mix lasts for a you know, week or two weeks. And I go, well, it's fresh. If you buy it in the store, it's already a week old. Whereas if you get it from me, I've harvested it probably the day before or, or two. So a real advantage of local agriculture is you're providing really healthy, fresh stuff uh, to people. Uh, I also think that small-scale growers take much more care of the soil, uh, you know, where they're growing. And they're able to do this because it's on a much smaller scale than if you had a, a large acreage.
All right, so what I consider part of the secret of organic gardening is the organic manner that you put into the garden. Uh, because uh, my job as a farmer is not to grow food. My job is to feed the microorganisms in the soil. And they require organic matter. And they can consume an incredible amount of organic matter. So, uh, and I'm not digging that organic matter in. I'm simply just using it as a mulch and it's breaking down. So right now the mulch I'm putting on will be gone by the fall. You know, it, the earthworms uh, will have consumed it, it will have, the fungi would have, will have broken it down. So I spend uh, a great deal of my time, not in the garden, but actually out gathering leaves. And I have about a mile of roads that every fall I go out with a, a leaf blower and I blow the leaves over to one side of the road and uh, I let them sit there for a month or two because I want them to get wet and I want them to kind of settle down. And then I have to come back and, and uh, gather up those leaves and I use equipment for that. I, I use a track hoe and a tractor and a dump trailer because I'm, I'm dealing with about 10 tons of leaves a year. And I bring them over to uh, what I call my leaf corral over here, which is just a fence, semicircular fence, where I dump the leaves and let them sit. And uh, a lot of people talk about, oh, well, they, they run over their leaves with a lawnmower to break them up. Well, that's totally unnecessary. All you have to do is pile them up and the, <clears throat> the bacteria and the fungi and the earthworms will work on it enough that by this time of the year, by late spring, uh, those leaves have already broken down to the point that with a little mechanical uh, tilling, and I use a mantis tiller to do that, you can grind them up into a consistency. Uh, you put them in five gallon buckets and bring them to the garden and then mulch with it. And uh, you're trying to put a good three or four inches of mulch. And like I said, that's gonna be gone by the, by the fall. And then you're gonna mulch again. So you're mulching. You're really mulching about twice a year. So you can't have too many leaves or too much compost for your garden. And so any opportunity that you have to, to gather organic matter. Now, a lot of people have a compost. And again, I'm kind of a lazy gardener. So I compost, but the method of composting that I use is called sheet composting. So my walkways are basically my compost. When I'm pulling out weeds and stuff, they just get dropped right in the walkway, and they're going to break down. And then every year or two, I'm going to, I'm going to dig my walkways out and put them on the beds, and, and that's going to add more organic matter to the beds. I'm also mulching the walkways, too, to keep weeds out of them. So basically, I have a mulched garden, and that's that's quite a bit of my time is just spent mulching my garden. But there, there are so many advantages to mulching, such as uh, you're not going to have to weed very much, unless you really like weeding. Mulching is great. The, the mulch also uh, conserves the moisture in the soil, and it keeps the soil temperature cooler. Now, I, I'm mulching kind of late in the spring here because uh, I wanted the soil to warm up when I seeded and put plants in. But now it's getting so hot that I really want to, I want to keep the soil cooler and keep the moisture in the soil. A well composted garden requires little to no fertilizer added to it. I'm adding a little bit of organic fertilizer and minerals about every other year. Uh, most of the nutrients are coming from, from the leaves that are going on to the beds. And the uh, earthworms are uh, eating, breaking down the leaves. They're actually pulling organic matter down into the soil. And they're bringing subsoil up to the top. So I think, I think it's over a period of about either six or ten years, I think ten years, Earthworms can actually 
plow about six inches of soil. So they're continually uh, uh, moving organic matter down into the soil and then bringing subsoil up to the top. Um, my, my goal would be to not use any kind of uh, pesticides in my garden, uh, organic or otherwise. I wouldn't use uh, chemical uh, pesticide. But there, there are certain problems that you get in the garden, like right now caterpillars uh, are really hitting my greens pretty hard. But we can use something called Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, to control them. Uh, it's toxic to the caterpillars, but much less toxic to humans. Um, but you, you still have, whoever is applying that, that pesticide has to be really careful not to get exposed to it. Uh, within 48 hours of application in the garden, it's pretty much gone. The sun and the rain has, has broken it down. Uh, and then it can wash off. You can wash it off your, your greens if there was any on there. But if you're out here spraying it, you have, you have to really be careful that you're not breathing it and you're not getting it on your skin. If you get it on your clothes, you're going to, you know, want to wash them. Um, one, one of the questions about BT is now it's engineered into uh, uh, GMO uh, corn and, and, and other things. And the EPA has decided that, well, since we've been spraying it on crops, organic and conventional, for years, it must be safe to engineer it into the plant. So if it's engineered into the plant and a bug comes along and eats it, you know, it's going to die. But when we consume that corn, we're consuming at least part of that Bt toxin, you know, that, that's uh, killing the insects. And that's different than just spraying the Bt on the crop, where it can, it can degrade and it can uh, break down. Uh, so I think that assumption by the e EPA that it's not harmful to ingest it is very different than using it as a, a spray. The EPA says, you know, that if, if you ingest it, the stomach acid is going to break it down. Well, it's going to get absorbed through your mouth and your tongue. And then your stomach acid may not be strong enough to break that toxin down. And especially if you consider somebody that's on a medication to lower their stomach acid, they're not going to be able to get rid of that toxin. Uh, and then if it gets into your bloodstream, there's some indication from research that it can affect your organs. It can affect uh, the lining of your intestines and your immune system, you know, uh, in some of the studies with, uh, you know, rats or mice. Well, BT is, for the most part, BT is not uh, one of the one of the concerns of organic farmers with uh, GMOs, where they've engineered the BT into the uh, plant, is that uh, insects are going to be exposed to it more, and that may allow them to develop resistance to to the BT. Uh, Whereas if it's sprayed, th there may be less opportunity for uh, those insects to develop resistance to it. Um, other, obviously, other pesticides and herbicides uh, can uh, enter the environment uh, through the through the groundwater, through runoff, in in the air. Uh, Roundup or glyphosate is one of the main uh, chemicals, herbicides that are being used uh, in, in incredible amounts uh, all over this country. And uh, it's polluting the water and the air and in the soil. And I think there are real concerns about glyphosate and Roundup as far as both uh, our health and the health of the soil. Uh, Roundup works by uh, binding up minerals in the soil. Uh, certain mineral, I think it's manganese, 
And manganese is very important in some of the processes uh, for all living things. So uh, it can kill plants, but it can also destroy the bacteria and the microorganis it, microorganisms in the soil. And that's your life, you know. Uh, there's a whole relationship between plants and soil. So uh, plants are basically feeding, exuding sugars into the soil and feeding microorganisms. And those microorganisms are, are bringing nutrients to the plants as they break down and die. So they're feeding the plants. Well, if you destroy your uh, soil biology, then you're, you've disrupted that whole relationship between the soil and the plant. Uh, chemical fertilizer, chemical conventional farming with chemicals, you're basically trying to just add chemicals to the soil to feed the plants. And this can produce kind of a roller coaster effect where you, at first you have lots of nutrients available to the plant and then uh, the amount of nutrients goes way down. So that, that can be a problem for the plant, that it's not getting a steady flow of nutrients that you would get in a very natural kind of setting with uh, very healthy soil with uh, lots of micronutrients in there that are providing uh, nutrition for the plants. Um, Health-wise, I feel like I'm an organic farmer. I'm not going to use any synthetic chemicals or fertilizer on, the, on my garden. And I, I believe there's a connection between healthy soil and, and the food that you eat. Uh, I consider that your food is your primary health care. That, uh, you know, we go to the doctor for pretty much chronic illnesses and doctors try to manage those illnesses, but, you know, for, for health, you really need, you know, healthy food. And your, uh, your garden and the food that you eat is, is where you get that health from. You get the nutrients that you need uh, and the protein and, and all that. Growing organically means not only healthier food for consumers, but it also is protecting the environment. And probably most importantly, it's protecting your farm workers. So uh, very often farm workers working in conventional agriculture are exposed to a number of chemicals either sprayed on the crops that they're having contact to. Uh, and really this is a social justice issue. Uh, that we protect the farm workers. If, you know, if they get sick from uh, exposure to pesticides, uh, it's very unlikely they're ever going to be able to prove that in a court case and get some kind of settlement. So, um, again, organic farming uh, is protecting the earth and our water and the air, providing the healthiest food that's possible. Uh, to consumers while protecting farm workers. Some people say, well, I don't really care whether I'm buying, you know, organic produce or conventional produce, but if you look at the uh, standpoint of the farm worker who may be being exposed to, uh, you know, chemicals, and then very often carrying those chemicals back to their household on their clothes and exposing their whole family to, to those chemicals. Or you may have a, a, a pregnant woman who's working in the field and she's getting exposed and, and there's the chance of birth defects from, from that chemical exposure. Uh, 
it, it's very hard to uh, assess risk when it comes to chemicals. And how do you assess the risk of one chemical or a mix of chemicals on an unborn child, you know, uh, fetus? Uh, I don't think there's any way to assess that risk of, of what uh, chemicals uh, could possibly do. And from my standpoint, you know, if, if you don't need chemicals, why would you use them? If, if you had a little container on your table with chemicals, it, with a spoon in it, would you take those and, and sprinkle it on your food? So, uh, when, when you look at produce and stuff, maybe it has some holes in it or whatever, you know, what you shouldn't worry about is what you see, it's what you don't see on your produce that you should really worry about. And uh, uh, strawberries is one of my favorite examples uh, that conventionally uh, strawberries, they use about 300, uh, 300 pounds of chemicals per acre on strawberries. Uh, a total of 30 different chemicals to grow uh, these beautiful looking strawberries that are pretty much contaminated with uh, chemicals. But it is possible to grow strawberries organically. Uh, a lot of people uh, purport that uh, we can't grow enough food without uh, using chemical, industrial chemical agriculture. And I, th I think this is very uh, short-sighted because uh, those farming practices are not sustainable. And very often those practices are degrading the soil. So in the long term, you're going to have less food because you're going to have less land to grow the food on. And every year we're losing thousands, millions of acres of land because it can no longer produce food because of the farming practices. Uh, in this valley, if we went back 100 years or more, uh, the farming practices were not sustainable either. And mostly it was because uh, this is hillsides that uh, would easily erode when, when farmed. You know, as, as soon as they were plowed and you had a big rain, uh, the soil could erode. But chemical farming is just you know, pretty much killing the soil. It's destroying the, it's burning up the organic matter in the soil. And the organic matter is crucial to the life of the soil. So once, once you've gotten rid of your organic matter in the soil, then you, you just kind of have this sterile medium that, that you're trying to grow crops on. And you can only do that then through the application of uh, chemical fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, uh, you know, to try to grow food. So again, I, I think it's very short-sighted to think that, uh, you know, th that those type of practices are going to feed the world in the long term. Uh, I think sustainable farming, you know, has, has a better chance of providing food in the future because you're really taking care of, of the soil. Um, I consider that uh, a garden like this is an investment in the future. So all the work that I put into uh, bringing organic matter into the garden and incorporating it in the soil through the uh, biology of the soil, it's actually improving the soil. It's, you know, my garden's much better than it was when I first started. And it will continue to improve, you know, as time goes. So you're, you have better crops, you have more food, uh, better quality food than you would, you know, just throwing out some chemicals, you know, each year.